Hi, I'm Dr. Gerald Ease. Welcome to Health Center from Downstate Medical Center. Today we're going to talk about babies, having babies, what nourishments people should consider before they even have a baby, things that will prevent all kind of defects and uh, while the baby's growing in that little tummy and so forth. And hopefully it'll give you some good advice to follow uh, even if you plan on having a family or having a child and things like this. Uh, prevention is at worth a pound of cure. And uh, so many things mothers are doing today that they didn't do years ago or exposed to as much when you think about it during pregnancy, such as just cigarette smoking or taking drugs or, uh, or many other things. Or, uh, poor nutrition. In fact, that's why they had the WIC program come in at one time, even after a baby was born underweight and so forth, mothers could get adequate nutrition for their children, things like this. And here at Dallas State Medical Center in the Department of OBGYN, Obstetrics and Gynecology, we have a fine young doctor who's doing a lot up there and hopefully will be with us for a long time because of his uh, um, abilities and his attitude and his uh, whole uh, training will lead to uh, healthy babies and healthy mothers. I want to welcome you, Dr. Gabor. Thanks for having me. Yeah, nice having you. <laughs> Dr. Gabor, now, uh, just a little background so your family will have a, something on this disc. Where were you born and, uh, uh, and uh, what made you go into medicine? I was born in uh, good old Brooklyn Hospital. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, sweet. That, <laughs> is that right? <laughs> yeah. Oh, Okay, go ahead. Well, okay. my father's a doctor, and uh, um, uh, it seemed like a natural evolution. I've always been attracted to science, and uh -huh. I volunteered in hospitals when I was in high school and college, and, uh -huh. and uh, here I am. What high school did you go to? Uh, Wheatleets in uh, Long Island. In Long Island, yeah, I think. Okay. High school. And college? City College. City College. Yeah. Medical school? Mount Sinai. All right. So, you well, well equipped. Yes, and I know before we became one, I was asking you how you chose that field of OBGYN. Well, you know, initially I never even thought I was going to go into OBGYN. Uh, it wasn't even a thought in my mind, but until uh, during medical school, uh, the students rotate through all the different uh, specialties, yes. like pediatrics and uh, regular medicine. Right. And when I rotated through obstetrics and gynecology, I found it. Uh, fascinating. I thought it was a great field where you deliver babies and right. you also do some surgery and also some aspects of regular internal medicine. Yeah. Well, you know, uh, here at Downstate, I went to Downstate here. Um, I came in here in 1958 <laughs> as a student. <laughs> and the head of OBGYN here was Dr. Lewis Hellman. Yeah. And Lewis Hellman was the honcho of OBGYN in this country, that is, looking after pregnant women, or, mm -hmm. you know, and doing the right thing during obstetrics and things like this. And he had a department that was so strict. You couldn't imagine you, everybody wore a white coat, white pants. You better not lean on a bed, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know. And it was really a, uh, uh, some training we had as, even as students coming through here. Yeah, I've heard stories. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, but it was a, and it served poor people. Mm -hmm. And they got the best uh, GYN care that anybody could get in the city, I don't care, private or what have you, because it was his staff, residents that made a difference, you know, because that is such a sensitive field to go into because when a person comes into you, I, I'll see how you feel about this, of course, they're at your mercy. I mean, they're palpating and doing the sonograms and things like this and so forth. But the things that are, maybe we'll start off with a person who just got married and they decided that they're going to have a child right away uh, and it came into you even as OBGYN, what would be some of the things that you would uh, tell them to more or less get a good healthy baby? Well, uh, I, I think you already mentioned some of the things. Uh, obviously, uh, bad habits like smoking and drinking uh, are, are, can always um, contribute uh, to the detriment of a pregnancy. Right. Uh, but I think the most imp one of the more important advances that have come recently is to take folic acid before you get pregnant. Okay. And folic acid is a substance that's found in all, almost all vitamins sure. and especially in prenatal vitamins. Right. Mm -hmm. And if I do meet a couple before 
they are pregnant and if they're thinking about getting pregnant, the best thing is to take folic acid because folic acid has been shown to decrease uh, defects, especially spinal cord defects yes, right. in a young baby. Right. Yeah, I wrote an article not too long ago about folic acid, frolic with folic acid. <laughs> it was called <laughs> frolic with folic acid. If you take an R out of frolic, <laughs> it's folic. <Get> folic. <laughs> so if you want to frolic, you better take a folic acid, you know. But there are so many things that can disturb a pregnancy while uh, uh, they're going through that uh, nine months. Uh, but that's the first three months. Uh, maybe you could just give a little indication or, to our listening audience what happens first three months of pregnancy. Well, as you said, pregnancy is nine months. First three months are most cr uh, very critical months in the sense that the organs are developing, um, circulation has started, yeah. uh, heartbeat is starting. Yes. Um, that's the period where if someone does have a miscarriage, they do have a miscarriage. Right. So genetics is also important for the chromosomes mm -hmm. to line up and the cells to replicate. Right. And if, so, if uh, a woman does um, take any medications, that, that's the point where the baby is most susceptible because oh. all the organs are just developing. Yeah. So medications taken at this point are very crucial because they can affect an organ early on as it's just growing yes. and uh, possibly cause a birth defect or, unfortunately, a miscarriage. Right. You know, I was made aware of this a long time ago when uh, they, people are using a lot of tetracycline, you know, yeah. and babies were born with brown teeth right. and things like this. We just don't know. That we don't know everything. Oh, boy. <laughs> you know, and, and right now, I dare say whether people are still getting good prenatal care because sometimes they don't get to see the doctor before three or four months into the pregnancy, and a lot of things have already started. Right. A lot of times a uh, woman doesn't know she's pregnant until two or three months into it because they, yeah. they missed their period and then sometimes uh, they think they just missed a period and doesn't, they don't think they're, they're pregnant. And then, right. Uh, and that folic acid right then, they have missed that whole they development missed it, of yeah, that neurological yeah. tube, yeah. yes, you know. So a general rule, what I try to tell my patients is try to take a vitamin every single day that has folic acid in it. Yes. So if you do get pregnant, you're already, you've already helped your baby. Right. You know, the, um, it's really interesting, uh, when I, the most organ that I, I shouldn't say organ, but most feature of the head that I was always look at, looked at when the baby was first born, I always was fascinated with the ear. Uh -huh. You know, because it's so intricate, the folds, uh -huh. you know, and how cells have to pre re uh, reproduce and die at the same time to get all these beautiful mm. curvatures in here. Mm. And when you look at the ear, it's an upside down fetus. Yes, yeah, some people have said that, yes. In fact, when we do acupuncture, you can almost put a needle in where that part on your head mm -hmm. is being bothered. A needle in there would be a, a point or down a lower body mm -hmm. up in the I hair. Part, the, yeah. yeah, so it's really interesting. Uh, what would you think is the most uh, congenital defect of babies today? Uh, now you had a span. How long have you been in obstetrics and gynecology? I trained here down to actually from 94 to 98. And right. I, I've been an attending since 98. Right. What do you, over a period of time, what defect uh, do you think that you have seen the most, say, uh, in, in uh, pregnancy? I mean, um, now. Well, we see growth issues. Okay. Where the babies don't grow too well or they grow too much, get mm. too big. Uh, we see a lot of heart uh, issues, holes in the heart particularly. Um, and rarely sometimes we do see, uh, sometimes the stomach doesn't close up and there's a, like a hole yes. and, and the, the bowels are coming out. And wow. Yeah. yeah. That's more, that's, that's, we see that only once or twice a year. It's usually growth issues or holes in the heart. Holes in the heart. Yeah. And what do you think, are, is there any preventive measures you do would tell a woman who's getting pregnant to maybe prevent that? I mean, at, at where, because I just had a, a friend of mine, the baby was born with the uh, uh, connection between the ventricle, mm -hmm. uh, one ventricle with the other, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. yes. Well, you know, uh, uh, a lot of these things have to do with other problems the patient may have, like diabetes. Okay. Or uh, nutrition also. So, I mean, if you have, a, if you have diabetes where your sugars are high, it's always best to... Uh, you know, keep your sugars at a normal level. Right. Uh, if you have blood pressure issues, 
may need to take medication to keep your blood pressure under control. Right. A lot of women don't know they have these things, unfortunately. Right, yes. That's, that's another big problem. That's right, right. And obviously nutrition is always a good thing. I mean, and then some women are taking medications and they don't realize that they're pregnant. They may be taking thyroid medication or if they have seizures, they may be taking seizure medication. You're right, right. Uh, and the, all those things can also contribute to uh, issues of the heart. And sometimes, I uh, mean, perhaps with your friend, uh, but sometimes it just happens for no apparent reason. I mean, right. you can't, uh, you, um, sometimes you can't pinpoint a reason and yes. things just happen. But good prenatal care should pick up all of those things uh, by a sonogram. Now, a patient comes into you and they're going to want to become pregnant. Do you give them any kind of, in our department here, any kind of genetic counseling where we may be able to predict that something will take place by the blood, certain blood tests? Uh, well, we have comprehensive genetic counseling here at, at Downstate Medical Center. Uh, we have uh, a highly specialized uh, sonographic unit, that, okay. an excellent sonographic unit, and they do um, count, they do screening for things like Down syndrome right, yeah. and chromosomal abnormalities. We can do it as early as two months. Wow. And we also do uh, amniocentesis, where uh, that's around three to four months where you take a needle and go through the stomach and take out some fluid to check on the chromosomes of the baby. Mm -hmm. And of course, the sonogram uh, can also pick up uh, abnormalities, structural abnormalities, like if there's a problem with the hands or the face yes. uh, or the heart. And we're about to embark on a new uh, test actually here at Downstate where it's called non-invasive prenatal testing where we can test for diseases of the baby through the mom's blood. Wow. So instead of doing uh, an amniocentesis, which right. is a needle through the mom's stomach, which can sometimes lead to a miscarriage mm -hmm. or infection, uh, we're about to embark on being able to take some blood from the mom's arm to check the baby, which is great because it's less dangerous. Right. And uh, I mean, it's, it's safe and, and it seems to work very well. How long has that been used? It's just, it's new technology. Mm -hmm. We're about to start next month, actually. Wonderful. Well, you know, it, it's just amazing how the field has grown, I, even from oh, the time yeah. you came into it, in a matter of a few years. Yeah. Uh, uh, things have just turned over to give you a perfect child. Yeah. You even know. from Lou Hellman's time, it's a hundred, oh, totally God. different. That's right, you know. And now, when a patient comes in and they say, show some signs of hypertension, mm -hmm. uh, What's your advice to them, or what's your treatment, or in follow-up while well, they're pregnant? Well, if somebody's high blood pressure, you you obviously monitor their blood pressure. Sometimes you have to start them on uh, blood pressure medication that is safe during pregnancy. Uh -huh. You also uh, uh, monitor the growth of the fetus because that could also cause growth issues in the fetus. I see. And we also monitor for signs of preeclampsia, mm -hmm. uh, which can explain preeclampsia. Preeclampsia is uh, a disease that you can only get during pregnancy where the blood pressure goes very, very high. Right, okay. And that can lead to seizures, right. which can be very dangerous, not only for the mother, but also for the baby. Yes, yes. So we also, from time to time, check the uh, protein in, in the urine mm -hmm. to see if there's um, possible development right. of this preeclampsia, and also check the blood from time to time. You know, I just had Dr. Benerjee, who's a diabetic specialist mm -hmm. here in the hospital, and, and we were talking about our diabetes, of course, and things like that. And um, is it true relationship between large babies and diabetes? Oh yes, yeah. Maybe you could. Speak well, on you that. Know, uh, a mom who is diabetic, where her sugars are high, the sugars go through the placenta to the baby, right? And then the baby sees all these sugars and tries to store it in its body. Okay. And that process of storing it causes the baby to become bigger than average. Mm -hmm. or we call that macrosomia. I see. So these macrosomic babies, uh, and so that's what you hear in the news. When you hear in the news about a 15 pound baby or a yeah, right. 17 pound baby born in, in some other country, uh, um, it, I can guarantee you the mom had diabetes. Yes, right. Yeah. You know, it's really <coughs> interesting that uh, now with genetic counseling, how you can say, predict uh, what genetic abnormalities mm -hmm. might be there. Uh, 
is there any other things? Uh, I'm uh, my field is sickle cell anemia, mm -hmm. also you know, and um, now they can. Uh, um, when I was here, uh, they were first finding out what sickle cell anemia back in '58 really was. Right. <laughs> At that time, they didn't realize the anemia and things like this. But then they got into genetic counseling and things mm -hmm. like this. Is a mother generally checked for a sickle cell trait when they? Yeah, uh, uh, at Downstate we check, we check the whole hemoglobin for any type of hemoglobin or blood disease like sickle cell anemia. Okay. We check for sickle cell, we check for thalassemia, All right. we check for any type of uh, abnormality in that regard for, through the hemoglobin. Oh, that's great. So, uh, as you indicated, we do have a higher percentage of patients who do have either sickle cell trait or sickle cell anemia yeah. who are pregnant. And sickle cell anemia patients are very, very high risk. Mm -hmm. uh, and we carefully, carefully monitor them at all times. They're very high risk patients. You know, I understand I, I, uh, she left here in about a, a year ago. She had one of the best prenatal or, um, clinics around. I forgot her name right now, but anyhow, they were doing a magnificent job on people who didn't have insurance mm -hmm. uh, uh, for, for their pregnancy. And uh, it was an open door for them to mm -hmm. come in and get excellent care mm -hmm. for the mother and child. I, you know, that's such a savings and great monies mm -hmm. spent in medicine when a mother doesn't are not aware of certain things and they just do anything during pregnancy. The mother gets in trouble, the baby gets in trouble, and the money that's spent is unbelievable. Right. <laughs> well, you know, at Downstate, we participated in a state program called PCAP, okay. which stands for Prenatal Care Assistance Program. So you don't have to have insurance right. to get prenatal care. You can just walk in the door and come to our clinic uh, on the on the first floor. And it's called Suite G. Yes. For gynecology, I guess. Yes. And uh, and register, and and you're covered during the pregnancy. And the babies in New York State are automatically covered when they're born. So they're, the babies will always have insurance. Well, that's wonderful. Yeah. That's, that's really great. Now, in uh, the papilloma virus, they've been talking about mm. uh, as being a real problem now, mm. and. Uh, thinking about testing young girls with it all the way up to mm -hmm. women who are on becoming pregnant. Mm -hmm. Maybe you could expound a little bit on your work that you're doing in this. Well, human papilloma virus, or uh, people usually call it HPV right. for short, uh, is a virus uh, that can cause uh, not only genital warts, mm -hmm. but it can also, at times, cause cervical cancer. Okay. So um, we've known about it for a while, but there was not a good way to test for it or a, a cost-efficient way to test for it. Right. But now we can test for it very easily through pap smears. Okay. And in the last few years, I'm sure your audience has, has um, heard about or, or received perhaps uh, the HPV vaccine. Right, yes. There's a vaccine. We have a vaccine now that you can actually get to prevent cancer, mm -hmm. which is astounding, oh, a yes. vaccine to prevent yeah. cancer. Right. Cervical cancer, mm -hmm. but a vaccine nonetheless. And uh, uh, the FDA, it's, it's, it's for women between the ages or girls uh, 9 to 26. Okay. And also for males, because young boys and young men can also get HPV mm -hmm. also causing general warts and sometimes causing um, pre-cancer or cancer themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, um, either anal cancer oh, right. or uh, not necessarily penile cancer but uh, skin near the penis also. Mm -hmm. Now how's, how, how has the population accepted this that you could use this type of vaccine or an when should a child start on it, a young lady start on it? I would, and the expense of this kind of thing to prevent possibly cervical cancer. Well, it's covered by the insurance companies. Mm -hmm. So I don't, uh, typically there is no out of pocket of expense for, right. the, for the patient. Mm -hmm. um, uh, people can get HPV, the way it's transmitted is through sexual contact. Okay. So ideally. Male to female, female to male? Male to female or female to male. Right, okay. Um, ideally, it would be best to get the vaccine to be fully protected before the onset of sexual intercourse. I see. So 
if you're talking about nine, ten year old, eleven year olds, that's a lot of pediatricians are giving it at that age group because it's best to give it to them at that age in order to fully uh, appreciate the full scope of protection it can offer. I mean, if you're 25 and you've already sexually active, it doesn't mean you can't get it. Right. Mm -hmm. um, but ideally, it would be before sexual. Well, how have the uh, population accepted this concept? Well, it's a good question. I mean, I think that's a, a larger question as to how people feel about vaccines in general. Yeah, sure. Uh, some people think vaccines cause autism. Mm -hmm. uh, some people think vaccines can make you sicker right. if you take them. Um, with HPV in particular, uh, some people don't like it because uh, it connotes that uh, some people think that if you give it to your child, you're condoning them uh, to having sex at a young age. Oh, I see. Mm -hmm. um, when in reality, all you're doing is, is protecting them right. um, from a future uh, possible cancer risk. And uh, in the United States, this cancer is... Um, not that common, but if you can get a vaccine to prevent it uh, with no real side effects, right? Um, it doesn't has not been linked to autism, mm -hmm. has not been linked to any other um, side effect in terms of causing your health to become worse. Uh, it can only help, actually. But what age uh, would you uh, suggest a child to get a female to get this vaccine? Well, you could do as early as nine. So nine years old. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, ideally before the onset of sexual intercourse. And how is it administered? It's a series of three shots over six months. Where would a shot be given generally? Well, it could be the arm oh, or the buttock. Right. Okay, yeah, all right. Way, yeah. Okay. Regular, regular injections. Nothing, I see. Okay. Nothing special to it. All right. Yeah. Right. Have you found folks not wanting their child to get this? Yeah, I, th I think they're either they don't believe in the vaccine, or uh, and, uh, or it's it's too tied up in uh, sexual activity, and they think they're telling their child to go have sex. So, right, right. Um, but I think if you sit down with the patient and explain it very carefully to them, more often than not, once they understand the full implication of the vaccine and how right. it can help, uh, they generally uh, take it. The hard part is keeping up with the shots. You may get one today, but forget to come back in two months for your second one and then uh, four months later for the third one. So the hard part is to keep up with all three. Are all they three usually shots. expensive shots? Are they expensive? Well, they're covered by the insurance company, so it's uh, um, typically patients don't pay out-of-pocket expense for that. Well, most a lot of folks don't have this type of insurance. In yeah, sense, I, that's a good question. I don't know the exact cost of it, per se, if you don't have insurance. Mm -hmm. um, I do know Medicaid does cover it, and right. insurances that run through Medicaid, like Health First, uh, does cover it. Right. Well, you know, a lot of these immunizations, I just had a call last night, believe it or not, a baby here on seven months had gotten all of these vaccines at one time. Mm -hmm. And the baby had this temperature. Right. And this was just last night, and, and they called me uh, how they should handle it because they said they took it to the hospital, and the emergency room kept sending them all home, mm -hmm. giving them uh, Tylenol mm -hmm. and things like this. And I just couldn't imagine how you could take a baby of seven months with a constant temperature of a couple of weeks, going back to four to three emergency rooms. And so I told them at the last one they went to, I said, well, have the doctor call me. He, I gave him even my mm -hmm. home. Mm -hmm. If they get discharged and say, you can go home with this temperature and bathe the baby in some w w tepid, tepid, tepid water, water, you know, which is ridiculous too. I mean, uh, when we had high temperatures in children, you at least have tepid water with alcohol in it, mm -hmm. <laughs> at least, uh, and you don't cover the baby up. You leave the baby stretched out there mm -hmm. uh, to, so the body can cool down. But, mm -hmm. you know, I'm just wondering, this is what's going on in the inner city with all these kind of things that, that a babies are not being handled. Well, you know, I, for, for young children when they get immunizations, one of the side effects is, is fever if they yes, do right. get a bunch of them at the same time. Sure. But for these older children who are getting the HPV vaccine, uh, there's really no, um, so, no so real side effect, side effect that you, uh -huh. like, like a fever that you have to worry right, about. Right. The, only, the only caution is, and again, you, probably, you, you don't see this that often, uh, the vaccine is made from yeast. Okay. So if you're allergic to yeast, you can't, you can't take it. Oh, I see. Okay. But I, I rarely have found anybody, any patient, allergic to yeast. Right. You know, they can't eat bread and so on. And 
I never really met anybody like that. Well, Dr. Gabor, I, you know, like uh, time is our enemy, and it seems like uh, 26 or a half an hour goes very so fast that we have to have you here periodically to keep us up to date <laughs> of your work. Time's already up. <laughs> <laughs> we have to do things to bring you on more frequently okay, to, no uh, to carry us through the pregnancy, to, after the pregnancy, mm -hmm. and things that we, uh, they should consider, you know. So I hope that you'll be available. We'll make our time available to oh, you. It'll be my pleasure you know, if you have me back. Because uh, not only will you do this, we'll have you. Uh, are you married? Yes. All right. Any children? Three boys. Oh, so you don't have to worry about the uh, getting that vaccine for the boys, huh? Well, it's it's also for the boys actually. It is. Yeah. My yeah. My, my, young, my oldest, uh, uh, I have twins, are seven, so they're not quite of age yet. I see. Yeah. But oh, well, then, now that's n another whole area that we're going to go through. So uh, mm -hmm. basically, we will ha definitely have you back. Well, thank you so because much. Because I think you could be the spokesperson for our great OBGYN department that was started many years ago by Lewis Hellman. Yeah, we can tell, tell some stories about Lewis Hellman. Well, that would be wonderful. <laughs> we'll do that the next time. <laughs> and so you folks out there, uh, keep a well baby, and we'll keep your baby well. Become the Downstate Medical Center and meet obstetricians like Dr. Gabor.